Welcome to We Exchange Podcast, the platform that connects women entrepreneurs in Latin America and the Caribbean with mentors and investors. In our episodes, you will hear these entrepreneurs tell us their success stories, challenges, and lessons learned venturing in the region. You will also hear international investors and ecosystem players talk about key success factors and trends in entrepreneurship. If you are interested in learning about the women entrepreneurs and the startups that are disrupting the world through innovation, or if you are interested in the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Latin America and the Caribbean, this podcast is for you. We are here with Rodrigo Bayer, principal at Redpoint Ventures. Rodrigo, we'd love to hear a little bit about yourself. Okay, perfect. So I started my career as, a, as an entrepreneur, setting up a delivery service for Brazil's largest drugstore chain. Quickly, we realized that did that the business wouldn't stand on its own. So we scaled down the business, gave it back to the corporate, which ran it for a very niche offering. After that, I actually went on to uh, consulting and gave advice to a bunch of companies, but lacked the feeling of follow-up and, and seeing the results of the things we were working on. And that combined with my entrepreneurial experience actually made me want to do venture. I went to the U.S. to try to do venture, did my MBA in the U.S. and ended up doing my summer and working most of my second year in venture. And then when I graduated, I decided to come back to Brazil and there was no industry. That was back in 2007. Uh, the industry was still uh, very small and mostly uh, with a private act mindset, not really a venture, more U.S. style. So I couldn't get a job and I went to McKinsey uh, for about four years. In parallel, I got together with four friends and started uh, investing my own capital to see if we could help the companies that we were investing and create a track record for ourselves. Uh, eventually, I had to go and run one of those companies because the founder wouldn't take over. And uh, I sold that company, went back to McKinsey, and then uh, we raised a venture firm called Warehouse Investimentos in 2010. Uh, with Warehouse, we uh, did six investments, uh, including the Series A of iFood, which is now a $4 billion company. When we were to raise our second fund, uh, we realized that the partners had different interests and wanted to go different directions. So I left the firm to create a new uh, C Series A early stage fund. I spent about a year trying to work through that. And that's when uh, Anderson invited me to join Redpoint and I've been here for six years. Now onto Redpoint. Redpoint Ventures is uh, a Latin American fund based out of Brazil. We have three managing directors, which are Brazilian people, and then two uh, U.S. funds that are partners in, in the fund. So Redpoint and Eventures. That's why we get this really long name. And we leverage their experience and their network to try to fast forward our learning process in venture, right? We, in 2012, we raised our first fund, which was $130 million. And we did 35 investments, uh, have a few success cases out of that. Uh, including two unicorns already, and there are a few more to come. And then in 2018, we raised our second fund, which is $175 million, and uh, we're deploying that. We have about 12 investments made on that, on that fund. Rodrigo, it's very impressive to have raised a first fund with that capital, $130 million. In Latin America, in general, venture capital funds start at very small amounts, $20, $50 million. So to what do you attribute uh, the fact that you were able to raise as a first fund such a large amount of money? There is a big component of luck, right? We, we were out raising at the right time, right? Brazil was really hot. The Economist had that famous uh, cover where the crisis was taken off, and there was a lot of demand for Brazil at the time. And we had a senior team and the contact of our U.S. partners. So when we put all those things together, uh, we ended up, we went out to raise $80 million, and uh, we got a lot of demand and ended up with 130 because that was the hard cap on the fund. We could have gone bigger than that. 
but that was luck and the network and a good team around it. Excellent. So that's a very good point. Networks do pay off, oh, as yeah, we yeah. know very well. <laughs> uh, now, thinking of you and your journey from entrepreneur to investor, um, tell us a little bit about your time as an entrepreneur. Uh, what was your company about? What happened to the company? How did you become an entrepreneur? And then how did you decide to, to do the jump to go to the other side and become an investor? Well, I was uh, an entrepreneur uh, 20 years ago. At the very beginning of my career, uh, I, I was actually searching for a job and uh, there was this startup that they were that was being created to do, to do drug store, drugs delivery for Brazil's largest drugstore. So it's basically a corporate uh, venture, right? And there was two people in the team. They, I came in, I was the third, and we scaled the business. We, we actually created uh, one of the first e-commerce sites of the country at the time. We didn't know it was going to be called e-commerce. And uh, what we realized quickly is that the unit economics didn't make sense. Uh, mostly when people want their medicines, they want fairly quickly. And it's on the vast majority of small, small tickets. So the delivery cost made it very hard to work. Um, so we, when we realized that and that there would be no solution to it, right? Uh, when people are in pain, they want their medicine quickly. They're not willing to wait a few hours so you can optimize your delivery cost. When, when we realized that, uh, we actually scaled back the operations and gave it back to the corporate and they started using it for high-end items that they didn't want to have distributed towards all uh, throughout all the all the stores right so they were taking oncologics and biologic medicines which are very expensive and centralizing that delivery through our e-commerce platform um so and and that's when i left and uh went to do other stuff so i went to europe and then came back and went into consulting and from I, I leveraged a lot the experience I had there. It was super interesting having to train people, having to set up systems, think about the processes, and, and the experience is very useful today. Uh, but also uh, finding out that honestly, I don't like to run a business. Uh, I, I like to be involved in the discussions. I like to to support and and try to f to come up with solutions for the problems. But I don't like the day to day of a business. Uh, and that was an important understanding for me in early in my career because that guided me to a more advisory and that's why I went into consulting role. But, but consulting didn't actually fulfill that because I couldn't follow up, follow the companies and see things get implemented and I didn't reap the benefits of what was being done. And I think the VC model actually aligned my three interests in entrepreneurship, in being an advisor and then following up and seeing the benefits of what was being done. So that, that's how I discovered the career and the role, and that's why I love it. Excellent. That, that is such an interesting take on your path from entrepreneur to investor. And thinking of you as an entrepreneur, and I know it happened 20 years ago, but what advice would you give to yourself um, that you didn't follow or you didn't know about it when you were being an entrepreneur? I, I think before you make the jump, there is one important thing, is create free options, right? And most people don't understand and, and, and don't realize that there are a lot of free options in life. Basically, if you take a year out of uh, college to start your own business, worst case scenario, you're losing a year right? You, you don't really lose much. Uh, if you go out after you graduate and you go into one or a startup or, or two, right? And they fail. It doesn't really matter. You're going to write a beautiful essay and you're going to get accepted into Harvard, Stanford, or MIT to do your MBA. And then you reset your career once again. So really creating those mechanics that allow you to take risks without screwing up your professional life enables you to go for the to swing for the fences. And most people are not proactive about it. They just get dragged into the career and they don't design the situations so they can take a year off to try to some, do something else. Um, so to, to me, that's one, right? How do you actually design your career 
design a path so you have free options that don't really hurt your career in the long term if they don't succeed, right? And then once you made the jump, and that's an important one, yeah. a senior person will cost two X what a junior person will and will deliver 10 X what a junior person will. A startup does not have the time to teach anyone. We are running against a, a fixed uh, runway. We, don't, we have 18 to 24 months of runway. We don't have the time for somebody to learn on the job. So hire somebody that knows what they are doing from the get-go. So th- those are the, my two key learnings. Excellent. And um, when you started investing, what were things that now with the years that have gone by, the lessons you have had, uh, what would be the advice you would give yourself when you started investing? One is don't be creative. <laughs> Every time we were creative in the deal making, we got burned. Okay. There is a reason why the terms are what they are. They have been tested and tried um, multiple times over the 60 years in the U.S. There is no reason why you should deviate from that. So we've got burned with founder vesting. We've got burned with with governance. We've got burned with uh, found, with funding a founder prior to him actually taking over the company. And right, he said, uh, "I'm going to get my bonus, and then I'm going to go run the company." And we funded prior to that. Guess what? I became the CEO of the company because he never left his cushy job. So honestly, uh, take the best practices that they apply in the U.S. Take the terms. Copy and paste. Don't get creative on that. Let creativity be, be used to the company and to the business you're developing, not on the deal making side. That sounds about right, <laughs> especially when you are in a country or in a region that is starting the industry. Some people tend to say, well, we are going to do it in a local way. And then yeah. the creativity may kick in in the wrong way. <laughs> um, so we also know that um, more and more in the industry, there is a business case, not a quota-driven case, to incorporate the, uh, women in the C-level uh, or to look for companies that have a diversified gender team. So what percentage of uh, your investments have been in startups co-founded by women so far? And if you have some, could you mention some examples? Sure. Uh, actually, much fewer than we would like, right? And l- let me take two steps back. Uh, when we look at our pipeline, we see about 3% of the companies co-founded by women. Okay. Three to four. And there is a very significant bias towards beauty, health, and uh, wellness. Yes. Which creates a problem, right? You're not going to do five of them within the fund. But when we look at our portfolio, uh, we are now at 8% of the companies uh, co-founded by women. Well, 8% of the founders and about 8% of the companies too are women. So we've done uh, Pismo, which has actually, it's four co-founders. Two of them are, are, are women. We're super happy with that. We've done uh, Gesto, which has Fabi as the, C- the co-founder and CEO. And now we just done uh, another company, which is not disclosed, which is co-founded by two women, uh, which we're really excited about. And today we approved uh, another one that's co-founded and the CEO is a woman. So it's, it's, it's getting there. But uh, still, uh, the top of the funnel bias is brutal. And... Um... No, I know it's it's difficult, but at the same time, do you see that there is a momentum building? You just said that you started with one, 3% in the pipeline, but today you already uh, approve an investment in in a company with one woman co-founder. How do you see it in Brazil? Is there a momentum building? And if there is, uh, to what can you attribute that? Um, there is momentum, uh, and I think, and honestly, I just think, right? I, I don't. Yeah. We we are getting more experienced founders as the ecosystem matures, right? And we are also starting to see second time founders, right? Or or people that weren't founders that wrote the 2011, 12, 13 uh, vintage of startups, and that are now going out and doing their their own thing. 
And uh, in those schools, uh, we normally see more women than fresh out of school, 28, 29, 29 year old uh, engineering students, right? Because that was the 2011, 12 profile, uh, which were which was more male than uh, than today. Today, we actually see people that are more experienced, and in more experienced companies, normally have more women. And do you have an opinion in what, if there is a little bit more momentum, if you are finding more experienced founders, what um, what action or what actors in the ecosystem have helped these women entrepreneurs uh, be able to thrive? Uh, I think there is a big component on role modeling. Okay. So uh, you, you take Fabiana from Gesto, you take Cristina from New Bank, uh, you take Camila Schucci from uh, Master Tag. You start to have a, a few women that uh, have been successful and that show that it's possible, right? Uh, because the, the tough thing about entrepreneurship is that most people will do it during their 30s and that's when women uh, are starting to think about having kids and competing priorities there uh, take a toll. But if you look at Fabi, she took one approach to it, uh, Camila takes another approach, and then Chris uh, takes a completely different approach. She actually had two kids while uh, running New Bank together with Avi. And, and each approach actually shows a different avenue, a different way of doing it and making it viable. And I think that role modeling helps a lot. Endeavor has helped a lot. And uh, yeah. Do you think accelerators have become more of a level um, playing field for women and men to feel that um, it's easier to get into an accelerator? Or you think that at least for Brazil, doesn't that doesn't apply? Uh, I don't think that applies. I, 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 I haven't looked at the data for accelerators. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine it to be fairly reflective uh, of what we see in the pipeline. So two to three percent of the companies co-founded by women. Okay, and then do you perceive differences when listening or analyzing pitches of women entrepreneurs versus men entrepreneurs? Uh, one, the oral pitch, and then when you receive you know, a written a teaser or a, a written pitch. Could you tell this was written by a woman and in the oral pitch, what could be differences that can be to their advantage or to their disadvantage? On the written, uh, we don't see a lot of difference. On the medium, when they are pitching, uh, they're a little bit less aggressive. The vast majority, right? Sure, sure. I think that, that that's something we watch for and try to calibrate. But uh, th to me, that's the biggest difference. It's how you pitch, how um, how forceful you are when you're you're pitching. To me, that's the the key difference. We we try to watch for that. Uh, the other day, I was uh, watching a, a TEDx uh, regarding biases on on VCs and how uh, the questions asked are different. I didn't see that apply to us, but I might, I might have missed. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a challenge because I, I usually talk about the mini-me effect. When you are a guy in front of a guy, a lot of things are understood by the body language, the way you, you talk among yourselves, and the same happened to me as a woman in front of another woman. So. Sometimes there are hidden bias that if we want to be pointed at them, we would be like, oh my gosh, I didn't mean it that way, no? But it's almost like we can, it's our mini-me in front of us, not, not intent. Great. So having seen that still the pipeline is coming really slow and in a small amount, what would be your advice uh, if you want to mentor women entrepreneurs, um, do they need, besides role models, do they need more bigger and deeper and more professional networks, specific training? What, what would you say that after role modeling can help uh, bridge this gap? There, there might be something to be done on communication, on, on, on being more forceful on stage, right? Okay. I think 
Chris uh, from Newbank does a great job there. On the professional network, I, I've seen uh, women uh, have as broad network and as men. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't think that makes such a significant difference. But the mentorship on how to deal with uh, starting the company and being fully committed to the company in a period where women uh, are thinking about other things, right, and how to deal with it and, uh, in a practical way, right? I'm not talking about uh, the esoteric aspect of uh, do you want to be a mother or not? It's like, how do, you, how do I actually make it fit in my schedule if I want to do both? You, you shouldn't have to choose between one of them. And, and uh, for example, Christina, she would take uh, the, the baby to the office and that's how they operated and that was the rule because yeah. that's how she wanted to do it. So I think building that and, cre- and showing that there are options, you, ca- you can create a nursery in, in the office, you can try to have a nanny, you can actually, we just invested in a company that uh, one, the, the company with the two co-founders, one of them actually had a baby during the signing of, ah. of the Series A. And she's out on maternity leave for three months, and we're fine with that. But um, I think I've seen women that wouldn't mention that they're pregnant. So that's going to be a bad surprise if I sign the term sheet and then you tell and, and, and you didn't come forward with that. You shouldn't change anything. We'll still push the deal, but we're building a relationship. Let's be open about it and find solutions that work for both. Absolutely. I like that approach. Um, so just Closing down a little bit, um, can you share with us, of course, keeping confidentiality, but what in your mind has been your best and worst investment and what lessons can you share? Best investment. I, I'll start the worst investment. Worst investment was a founder. Uh, we actually failed to identify that he was a bad character. Okay. Huh. And, th- and that failure bites us, right? We, we should, we should, the guy was good. He was a real, real <coughs> criminal, to be really honest. But uh, the best investment, we actually, it's like choosing to pick a, a sign. It's like, we like all our companies. They're <laughs> all great companies. And uh, they, 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 they go through different moments. They go, there are different stages. We have companies that are now in 17 countries and are worth more than a billion. And we have companies that, we just invested that have three people. It's really hard to compare. And they have the horrible habit of changing places, right? You think the company is going great and then it, it has problems, then it recovers again. So I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't be able to choose. We just, we like to invest in people that we trust, that we respect and admire. So as long as we get those three rights, we are happy supporting them. Um, yeah, I think as always, it comes down to it may be business, but it's all about people. So when you talk about, you know, the bad character or the fraud, uh, that always makes you reflect on your due diligence techniques. So did that experience make you uh, come together as a team and said, what did we miss that we didn't see the character of this uh, entrepreneur? And, and what, what was, you know, something that you implemented as a consequence of that? We banged our heads against the wall on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and honestly, we, we, we changed a little bit uh, our due diligence process, put a more thorough uh, KYC. But even that more thorough KYC, they would still pass. It was just a criminal. So... We keep asking ourselves if we could have identified it, and I don't think we could. Okay. Yeah, but those are the war scars that you have to have when yeah. you do it. No? You never learn. Yeah, exactly. So just finishing, what is next for Redpoint Ventures, and what is next for you? Uh, next for Redpoint, uh, we are... Excited about uh, investing in second fund. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, good things coming out of first fund. So uh, we see very happy years uh, ahead. Mostly we are seeing a pickup in the pace and the quality of pipeline because of the maturity of the ecosystem. So we are looking forward to the next five, 10 years here. And what's next is keep doing it. Uh, VC is a very long-term game. 
and we're setting up the firm to be here for the next 20, 25 years at least before I retire. So my vision <laughs> of what's next is 25 years away. Oh, good. Excellent. We want to keep in the market for many, many decades to come. Um, Rodrigo, I thank you for all your insights. I encourage you to keep going, trying to find the jewels in gender diversified teams, not only women, but women and men who, who see the value of not having mini miss in front of them. And, um, to, till the next one. And I personally, we look forward to seeing those very good pipeline companies coming through as investments and sharing into the adventure of venturing. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. We Exchange is an initiative powered by IDB Lab, the innovation laboratory of the Inter-American Development Bank. For more information about what We Exchange does to support women entrepreneurs in STEM from Latin America and the Caribbean, visit www.weexchange.co. For more information about each episode and our guest speakers, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media. In Twitter, you can find us as at WeExchange and in Facebook as WeExchange Community. Until next time.